Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Jessica Ortega and I'm a senior staff psychologist. And why we're all here together today is to talk about students in distress and ways to respond if they're in distress, especially in the nature of the work that you're doing with them. And so today we're going to spend some time talking about that. So I want to talk about what to expect from today just to give you a general overview. We're going to talk about how to increase your awareness of signs of distress slash crisis. We're going to make that distinction in a minute so you know kind of what that looks like. Want to develop response skills for intervention with your students? So you want to know, how do I approach the student? Or maybe you're a little anxious about that, and so how do you work through that? What kind of skills can you use? Want to know how to consult and refer? You want to know your resources. You want to know who you can talk to in the case that a student is in distress. Where do I send them? How do I talk with them? Who can I ultimately refer them to? And self-care for you. This is for you. In your work with your students, that's a lot that you're carrying, but you're also carrying other roles on campus. And so we want you to be able to take care of yourself, OK? So here's just a basic question just to reflect on, OK? What are your fears, concerns, or worries in helping a student in crisis? So some of us have been in crisis situations, and maybe we're great in those situations. Other people are triggered and sometimes paralyzed. So you might identify with some of those things. Crisis happens for all of us. All of us have gone through something. Sometimes it's an existential crisis. It's an identity thing. And sometimes it's a real, like, say, natural disaster. There's different situations that can happen in our lives. And so we can all perceive the crisis differently. We react to it differently. And so what I put down here are some of the things that are triggered by us in that particular crisis. So even for all of you, think about a time in your life where you had a crisis and what were you thinking at that time? What were some of the feelings you were having? What, were what was triggered at that time? What were the behaviors that you were experiencing at that time? Then think about the social support that was around you, which could be family or friends or whomever. What things did they do or say that was helpful? And what things did they do or say that was not so helpful, maybe even harmful in your coping? It's important to think about these things because the student you might be helping is going through a mixture of all those things or some of the things you're even thinking right now. Okay. So let's make that distinction I talked about, the distress versus crisis. It's interrelated. Distress is kind of a dramatic change in demeanor, our routine. It's when we kind of get knocked off our kind of focus and it throws us off kilter and then we're like, whoa, we're back. We're back. Crisis is when it's hard to get back. It's when something has happened and the distress is so extreme, it's so magnified that it makes it difficult to function. It interrupts the functioning of the daily responsibilities. It makes it hard to relate to people. A lot of things are happening. And so this is the piece that we're going to be talking more about today. So I want to pose this question to all of you and again to think about this. How would you know if a student is distressed? I keep using that word, distress, distress, crisis. What would you visibly see or hear? What would be going on with a student to tell you they're distressed? Can you tell me? What would be some things that tell you? Yes. Maybe if they come to class hungover and they smell like alcohol in their breath and they don't really go out and they don't really drink too much. That's a good one. That's a change from what you know to be true about them. Yes. Noticing any physical appearance out of the norm, like messy hair, hygiene. Mm -hmm. That's something you can notice, definitely. Yes. If you uh, hear from another source that maybe they're having home life problems or uh, problems with their uh, friends or family. That's a really good example. That can happen. Maybe someone's been showing up late a little too many times and it's been turned into a frequent absent type of thing. Very good example. And I'm going to just throw them all up there so you can visually see them as we talk. You might, as a grad student, see some of your students academically struggling. You might notice that they were once turning in all their homework, they're turning in all their assignments, they're coming to office hours with you. However, now they're not doing that. They're absent from class and you're concerned. Physical appearance, we, we talked about this. Some of the hygiene or grooming changes that can be happening. Um, you may even smell alcohol in their breath that was never there before. Things like that that don't seem consistent with that person. Okay. 
Some other areas, safety risk indicators. They may verbally or demonstrate something of risk. You're wondering if they're even thinking about hurting themselves because maybe another peer of theirs came to you to talk to you about their concerns of hopelessness, they're feeling worthless, they're saying things like, what's the point? I got an F, I failed this, I'm not gonna get into med school. That is worrisome to you. And some of the psychological indicators, sometimes the student might come directly to you or via another peer and say some things about some personal distress that's going on, maybe in their family, maybe they lost a parent, maybe they lost a dear close friend. There's something going on that's, that's saying there's some distress. So how would you determine distress? We've talked about the signs, things you can kind of look for. These are some questions you can ask yourself to really hone in to determine if there's distress. Does the behavior that the student exhibits seem out of the ordinary? We kept looking at distress versus crisis, right? Do we notice anything that's shifting in what's ordinary from what you've seen in that student? Does the behavior place anyone, including the person in question, in a life-threatening situation? This might be clearer, right, if it's life-threatening. It's something that we might know the reaction to, let's call the police. Is the behavior that the student is exhibiting getting worse, less frequent? Is it better? Again, noticing those changes. And do you believe that it's appropriate for you to deal with the particular problem, or is it probably beyond what you can handle? You need to know what your limits are. And we're gonna talk about that today in terms of your role, knowing your limits, because your role is well-defined as a, as a supervisor, a supporter of your student. However, you're not expected to be a mental health professional. You're not expected to assess them, do therapy, any of those things. So let's talk a little bit about this. Let's talk about the actual skills and when you're interacting with that student. And it does depend on your rapport with the student. Either you know them really well or they're just kind of another face um, in your class. Awareness. What do you observe or know about the student's concerns? Again, going back to the changes, what have you been noticing about that particular student? You're just kind of laying your eyes on them. And when you're doing that, you're paying attention to some of these things. So nonverbal. Nonverbal means what? Body language or eye contact, nodding our heads, attentively listening without saying anything. Okay, even vocalisms, mm-hmm, things like that. But we're paying attention if, if it's in the construct, in the environment of you teaching them or supervising them, you're in a lab with them. Maybe they're not paying attention as much. Maybe they're slouched over, they're falling asleep. Things that you didn't notice before. You can tell these different things, right? Paraphrasing, concise reframe. So it's taking this a large volume of information that they give you. Maybe they're really upset and they're saying a lot of things. You make it very concise, use your own words, and that demonstrates to them that you're paying attention. And reflection. So when you're reflecting back what they feel, again, you're paying attention to the emotional underlying feeling, okay? So you can say things like, you seem upset, or what you just said seems really frustrating to you. It must be really difficult to feel that way. You're really drawing to the emotional label. So let's move on. Once you're kind of attending to them, you're listening to them, you're paying attention, you're paraphrasing, you're understanding what they emotionally could be going through, you wanna think about some questions you're gonna be asking, right? It depends where their, emotion, their emotionality is. So some closed questions are good when you have a person that's really not speaking as much, they're really lethargic, they seem maybe really depressed. However, open-ended questions could be helpful too. What's going on? How are you feeling? I noticed you haven't come into class. Can you tell me what's going on? Things like that. And as you're talking with the student, you want to summarize their current concern. You've been following them, you've been listening to what they have to say, but all the while you're, you're thinking, what do I need to do? How am I gonna help this person? So you're gathering information, that's your central job, is just to gather information, and you wanna facilitate possible solutions. And we say facilitate because that, that comes across as collaboration. We want to collaborate with our students. We want them to feel empowered to make decisions for themselves. So what is your role? So with that, let's talk about these. Listen. 
Yes, we listen auditorily, but we want you to be empathic and learn to kind of talk with the student, normalize, okay, I hear what you're saying, what you're saying is important and it matters. Let's see what we can do about that. Use let's language, talking as a we, so it feels collaborative. Normalizing, you want to reassure the student that college students go through a lot of different things. And actually, the people that go to the counseling center or seek help from a professional is for a lot of different reasons. So you can normalize. They go in for relationship issues. They go in for things related to academics, changing majors, all kinds of things. And so it helps normalize why you would go to the counseling center or somewhere for help. It doesn't have to be the counseling center. It could be just someone that's a professional. Setting limits is important in your role. So when you're setting limits, when you start feeling like this is too much for me, that should be your sign that I really am going beyond my role and I need to talk to somebody about helping me with this. You want to think about your different areas of support on the campus, which leads to the next one, consulting and referring. You want to know when to consult and when to refer and who those people are. So know your resources on the campus or know someone who does know the resources. Maybe this is your first year as a grad student and you're still trying to figure things out for yourself. So you're like, whoa, I'm supposed to help them get to the right resources when I'm still trying to learn them. Go to your immediate supervisor, talk to maybe your faculty, your dean, whomever that person is that can help guide you through the process. You also want to destigmatize what accessing help looks like. For some students, going to a counseling center or even student health center, whomever it is on a campus where there's some stigma or taboo attached to it, and that could be based on how they were raised, some cultural nuances, maybe in their culture and their family, you would be in trouble. You would get in trouble if you talk about anything related to a private concern. So there might be some real reasons. So I always say when you destigmatize, you want to talk with your student about what are some of the obstacles and some of the barriers that they're experiencing for why they won't go to the counseling center. What are they fearful of? That might open up some opportunities for you, OK? And also self-care. We've talked about this. Self-care. Taking care of yourself. Being aware of what your limits are is self-care. Knowing when to connect with resources is self-care. Knowing what you need to do to replenish and revitalize yourself after you've been working with someone and talking with a student that's in distress. That's really important. So making a referral, what that looks like. We keep saying this, but I'm going to keep saying it to the very end, is knowing your resources. Yes. All campuses are different, and so you need to know where they're at, what are the contact numbers, the locations, okay, our office hours. And some of the response assistants can look like campus police. It could be after hours care. There's some urgent care triage systems on campus. You want to know what those are on your campus. And you can see a lot of that information online. There's a link right here to the Red Folder Initiative that is through the University of California Office of the President, and it's it provides all the different information across the different campuses. So you just click on your respective campus and you would find the information of some of the things we've been talking about today in terms of the signs of distress, how you would connect with someone, what are the listing of the resources, things like that. And ultimately, if you do have some suspicion or there's more than just a suspicion, you've heard a student talk about risk to ending their life, so suicidal risk, or even to hurt somebody else, Immediately, you need to contact someone. If it's the police, great, trust your gut. If you're accessible to the counseling center and it's within the office hours, call right away. You don't want to hesitate when it comes to that. And so with that, conclusions and final tips that I leave for all of you. One, hopefully you walk away with this knowing you're not doing therapy. This was not a training in therapy, but it was a training on really looking at the early intervention skills that you can use if a student's in distress in that moment, and then ultimately, you're going to want to get them connected. You can make a difference, because remember, you are in a really important part of the steps for them to get the help that they need. Oftentimes, you're the first person they're going to see and reach out to, or you're just going to be noticing some of these things before any one of us are going to see it. Refer, refer, refer. That's what we want you to do. Refer. Gather an information knowing what's going on, and connecting the student with the appropriate resource.
And can't forget about you, your self-care, and I've been talking about that. Don't forget about that. And so with that, I wanna thank all of you for being here, being so attentive. If there's any questions you might be having, feel free to contact me or anyone at your respective campuses, or definitely con connect with your mental health professionals on your campuses. Thank you so much. For more information about mental health services offered on your campus and training for graduate research and teaching assistance, contact Student Health and Counseling Services at 530-752-2300 or visit our website.